My name is Ben Lopez. I'm the executive director of the National Association of Latino Independent Producers, NALIP. Hi, everyone. This is Jack Rico, and thanks for listening to episode 71 of Highly Relevant, a U.S. Latino podcast focused on the relationship between Latino and mainstream pop culture. As you heard at the top of the show, I'm conversing today with Ben Lopez, executive director of NALIP. Him and I have exchanged DMs on Twitter here and there, and uh, I decided to have him on the show because he is a very knowledgeable and well-versed man in the Hollywood and media business game, and it made for a very good conversation, which I think you guys will definitely enjoy. We discussed the rock-bottom depths Hispanic actors have reached in front of the camera. Like, what happened, and, and how do we fix it? Also, what's the secret behind what the African-American community is doing differently than the Hispanic one? And Randy Falco, the CEO of Univision, recently announced he's retiring early. Not who, but what type of person should replace him? Is it time for a U.S.-born Hispanic to run it, and should it be a woman? And we also chat about how Nalip's whole mission is to help Hispanic creatives break into Hollywood. It's a real, real conversation about how corporate culture in the media business really works, so you don't want to miss this. What is NALIP? NALIP is a uh, nonprofit membership-based organization dedicated to advancing Latinos in media in front and behind the camera. What is your job specifically as an executive director, what is it that you do? My job is to primarily uh, fundraise, uh, represent the organization, um, forge partnerships with sister organizations, and really grow the impact of our, of our mission, which is to, to advance Latinos, to um, really position the organization to be a trusted source of Latino uh, talent, um, IP and executives in the entertainment and media ecosystem. What were you doing before you became executive director of Nalip, Ben? Um, I, I came from, uh, I, I graduated from political science out of the University of Arizona, but I came into, I kind of fell into it. I had a background in music production. I was a, a percussionist. I was also producing some hip hop back, you know, uh, back in high school. Um, and I was also doing multimedia projects. Eventually, after, while I was graduating for political science, um, it just so happens that uh, a feature film landed in where I grew up in Tucson, Arizona, and they wanted me to help them out. I ended up producing the entire feature film. Um, it was basically a volunteer experience. And out of that, um, it really awoke in that spirit to, to produce uh, media. And uh, it just so happens that around that time, Nalip uh, landed in, in, in my hometown, uh, uh, and they set up shop to do the Latino Producer Academy, which is an, a lab to advance uh, documentary and uh, feature filmmakers. Um, so I happened to be, I don't know, I guess the, the right momentum. I had always been a fan of both, uh, you, know, the, 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 you know, the careers of a lot of filmmakers, you know, such as Kubrick and everybody else. And then, of course, reading, you know, Rebel Without a Crew really awoke that sense in me. It right, that Robert well. Rodriguez uh, book. Yes, right? it really, that did a job of me. And I think it really made me feel like, look, do I need to go to film school or not? And then the other part that really changed my life was like while I was finishing my degree at the U of A, I decided to pursue a second degree, which is in media arts, because I felt that I really needed that paper to, you know, that that diploma to certify mm -hmm. that I was mm -hmm. indeed a filmmaker. Um, and uh, at that moment, um, an opportunity opened up through uh, one of the internships, uh, the departments there at the at the university, and they sent me to Telluride as uh, to work for the press desk. That changed my life completely, and that led to serendipitously into a bunch of other opportunities, including traveling to Japan and producing. So um, everything happened within a scope, I would say, 12 to 18 months, and uh, it landed me in a multi-picture deal. Um, I'm skipping through a few things there, um, <laughs> where I started uh, producing myself uh, independent, micro-low-budget uh, films. Now, where does the passion come from for you wanting to help Hispanics in the media business? I, I think for me, I have a strong desire to, um, um, to you know, have people succeed. Um, it, it's, it's rare, to, to be honest, even when I, when I work out there in the ecosystem, some people ask me, wait, you're a nonprofit 
and you guys are now op you're operating almost like a quasi management agency. You guys, you guys should be getting something like a 10% of the deals. And I'm like, no, we, we really appreciate the fact that we're very focused on the mission, which is how do we multiply Latino content creators in this space and, and help them advance. So for me, ultimately, is the passion to see other people succeed. Um, and, and grow and help each other out. I think I really believe in the 360 mentorship, that it takes a village approach. Uh -huh. And I've seen how people have succeeded uh, by having that organizations working together, including mentors and advancing careers. So it's it's effective. Give, give me an example of that. So one example is, uh, for example, a lot of our members have gone through, you know, the programs, workshops. We have a big media summit that takes place in, the, in, the, in June 20, like this year is June 21st to the 24th. Um, let's say you're an emerging content creator and you, let's say you're, and what my, what, what I mean by uh, uh, emerging content creator is someone that maybe just came out of film school, uh -huh. um, maybe someone that's still out here in LA, maybe they, they're already working, but they, they're still struggling to find financing, mentorship and other, other opportunities for them. So when I see someone that attends the summit, they experience the, you know, like the ground level of all the things that are happening in media, both in television, film documentaries, digital and, and, and VR technologies, and they see the opportunities and they apply for our programs such as the Latino Lens Workshop Series or they apply for the uh, Latino Lens Incubator Series, which I'll go a little bit more in depth, and they get an opportunity to receive resources, actually mm -hmm. um, uh, funds for their films and their projects. Um, and along the way, they're being mentored by um, a composer, let's say, someone who has, uh, you know, worked on feature films and the priority projects and they also get a chance to meet managers like um you know from from circle confusion or three arts and they have a chance to to learn what it's like to to speak to a manager and then of course an opportunity to meet executives that are going to be the future content buyers and they start tracking them this is incredible uh, when I, if you yeah, if you if you're if you're a young filmmaker or a young mm -hmm. uh creator of content and you happen to be latino for example let's just uh create a location of New York City, Washington Heights, which I know so many content creators up there are doing their own stuff, but they probably don't know about Nalib. You're basically telling me that that yes. young guy has to reach out to you, and once mm -hmm. he reaches out to you, he's put in some sort of incubator program where he then gets to probably have uh, larger resources in order to create his content yes. and then understand how the business works of mm -hmm. meeting agents and important. managers and how to get your movie, I guess, to a studio. Yes, I, I think what's important is to understand the I call it uh, racing their their entertainment ecosystem IQ. <laughs> it's very important. It's super important because they might they might come I, again. There's it, film school is great, and even some of the autodidactic folks, kind of like Robert Rodriguez, you know, maybe they went to film school, maybe they dropped out of film school, and maybe maybe they never even went, and they they want to get a, a sense for. What is it like if I, because they need to figure out what they really want, like to create one project versus uh, a slate of projects. That's also another one that really gets gets them. And then some of them, they say they are producers, but actually they're directors. And then the opposite. Mm. Some of them are really, they're not directors. They're really more producers, writers. And so it takes off a little bit of time to really find themselves. And I think that's what I call the breakthrough. It's a breakthrough moment that happens for emerging uh, content creators. What we have, by the way, at Nalip, is not just the, those emerging folks. We also have the mid-career professionals. We have everybody that's, like, let's say, working at Paramount. They're working at business affairs, and maybe they're looking to make the switch uh, to become producers, or maybe they want to direct or write. Um, and then we also have writers, directors, you know, people in the, in the actual writers' rooms, right, in television and film. And then uh, we also have the top, you know, the top 3%, the ones, the, the leaders in the field, you know, the ones who consistently are you know, making making films. They have multi-picture deals at the different studios. And those folks come back as speakers. Mm -hmm. They come back as mentors. And they come back to really look for, for talent. Uh, one recent example is Tanya Saracho. Who's oh, yeah, Stars Vida. Uh, Vida. Yeah, that's coming out May 6th, by the way. And, it's, and she's it's, part, it's she really was part of the Nali program? So that, so Tanya, we met through a larger network of other writers that are currently working in Hollywood. And we, we basically went to them. Instead of asking them, what can you do for us? We asked Tanya, hey, what can we do for you? And she's like, look, I really need some writers that are, you know, have a, an authentic voice, um, uh, specifically targeting folks, you know, writers that maybe come from the Lincoln Heights, Boyle Heights, East Los Angeles area. And I'm struggling to find some 
some writers that really make sense. You know, we have recommendations for pretty much every every talent agency. But I would love to see what you guys send us. And so you so, guys are a hub for Latino yes. creative talent. You're ba- yeah, and it's funny because I think you used the uh, the 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 uh, the term of like a pseudo agency. And, and do you feel like you operate like that? Yeah, many times. I, I think what what used to happen before when when we approached the studios, many times, and obviously we love working with all the different um, office of corporate responsibilities, the diversity and inclusion programs. But we found that once we started operating, where we really focused a lot on the talent development side of things the talent development departments of those uh, studios started responding to us. So it was almost like a double whammy uh, because it's great to go through through a lot of those diversity programs. Sometimes they select two at a time, three at a time from, from the Latino community. Um, but if we were to essentially wait or, or try to focus on how do we come to a parity compared to our demographic, to be honest, Jack, we would be waiting for almost 500 years to yeah, catch up. I agree. If we were just to rely on those programs. So it's great that we have them. It's a great start, and we can build on top of those programs. But now we're, we're going directly, um, especially with trusted, embedded talent. That's what they want to see. Are they vetted? Who's reading them? And so we borrowed a little bit from the tech side of things, from the unconscious bias work that, that Google was doing. Was essentially, instead of, let's say, Jack sends me a screenplay, and because we're friends, so I know you're something, and then somehow we get it to someone else out there. It's not, we first look at the material, and we have, um, I mean, by the way, um, we take off the first page of that screenplay, so there's no bias, whether you have a, a, a Z in your last name or anything. We mm-hmm. look at the material, and those readers, they're looking at, what are the things that are missing from here? Is it a complete writer? Do they do they have a scope? Do they understand tone, structure, all of that? And then based on those recommendations, we either recommend them to go through a program, and it doesn't have to go through an elite. It could go through maybe Sundance, Tribeca, Film Independent. We make those type of recommendations and mentoring. And then if they're ready to go, um, we make that recommendation into uh, uh, the next level, which is, you know, writers, directors, other people that are, are looking to partner up. And also agents and managers, they're always constantly looking for that that it's almost like ordering takeout now, you know, they, 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 they make those calls to us and they're like, Hey, can you get me three Latino Ryan Kuglers, two Ava DuVernay's, you know, people, you know, sometimes it gets a little bit, uh, 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 um, you know, overwhelming because I always ask them, great, you want this talent, but are you willing to grow this talent with us? And I think that's where Nalip is really operating, integrating the system that we were employing the entire ecosystem to help us grow those writers and directors now this all sounds this all sounds promising but i look at the landscape and i've been complaining about this for years now how and i'll just tell you some of the challenges that i see Mm -hmm. there's no latino actors nominated at the oscars this year and we haven't had any since 2012 and before that it's even been longer there are no latino movie stars at all. So the on-screen representation seems to be much more glacial paced than yes. the success behind the camera. So I guess you guys are doing great with directors, producers, cinematographers. The technical side seems to be coming up, you know, very well. Like uh, we're some of the best talent in the world when it comes to those positions. But there's no Latino shows on broadcast TV that have Latino stories, not Latino actors in a secondary or tertiary role, and that's Correct. problematic. Uh, mm-hmm. There's no Latino anchors on morning shows. I know because I'm on the Today Show with all these ladies and all these people, and I'm the only kind of dark-skinned guy there. There's wow. no Latino to really talk about. And, and Natalie Morales, who used to be on the Today Show, now she's on Access Hollywood. So that kind of kills and eliminates whatever Latino representation you see. Um, mm-hmm. There's also no Latinos on late night show. George Lopez, oh, I think, yeah. was the last person to do a late night show. There's no Latino anchors on primetime news. I, I, I read a, an article where it says supposedly 22 Latin X shows that have been picked up to series since 2000. Right. Barely any of them are still here today. And then the Correct. New York Times just took out a diversity stat in the newsroom, and we're 3% just in there. That's not Ridiculous. mentioning any other media outlet in the United States of America. Elias Lopez, who is the uh, uh, the head guy at New York Times in Espanol, mm-hmm. he works at the New York Times, and he, and he tweeted out that he was complaining about the whole thing, about how is it that we're in the middle of this crisis of having people in positions of authority. 
uh, not being able to even be given opportunities to change anything. Why do you think we're in a position like this and what can we do about it to fix it? It really it starts at the beginning of the cycle. It really starts like as young as possible with even at the fifth grade level. Um, you know, there's there's definitely other communities that are are it's it's really normal to be able to say to your to your parents, hey, listen, I, I would love to pursue this career as a director because we're you know, our community is not used to there's there's really no not ongoing tradition. I mean, we're obviously storytellers, especially on the entertainment side of things and music, it's a little bit more natural there. But to say to your parents, I'm a writer, I'm a director, I want to pursue entertainment, it seems a little bit unrealistic with with families that are working class and and, and even even middle class. They're like, well, wow, man, you're you so right. So My mom safer. said the same thing to me. You know, yeah. yeah. And, and imagine saying, look, I want to grow up to be an executive and and be be at Viacom. Or the, it's a little bit harder because there's really no family, no traditions, folks going out there, and so it's a little bit harder without the padrino and the madrina. You know, the godfather. Uh, right. and godmother that can help you in the mentorship in that process because that's really how it happens i always recommend our folks that are thinking of pursuing this career make sure you take out someone you know like uh, to to lunch that is going to be in the field that you think you're going to pursue and i had that transition going with when i used to work in youth programs i would tell them look if you want to be an architect hang out with architects talk to them uh, i myself you know i i was pursuing political science because i thought i was going to go into pre-law and all of that stuff and i realized that's not really what i wanted to pursue it was really film and entertainment so it's really coming out of that that mentality so going and really fortifying the educational system and also affording our folks to really see see themselves realistically as being part of this pipeline is really important you know having that ongoing tradition so programs like Young Storytellers, Gato Film School, um, Inner City Arts, you know, all these really, really incredible programs that are all over the U.S. that are now encouraging folks because now you see with the automation that's happening, the one career that you can't really replace right now is the creatives. And if we really make a, a systemic, um, um, in, you know, a change there where we encourage this generation, the C generation and mm -hmm. beyond, to really pursue the creative arts and, and, and let them know that, for example, here in California and, of course, in New York, it's one of the, 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 the areas of widest growth. Same thing with the technology, right? Mm -hmm. So if we encourage them to really pursue this career as early as possible and encourage that mentorship and then even, we, you know, when we lose the majority of them, probably between high school and I would say 22 years old, um, that's when they're not applying for the film schools because it's really expensive. Um, no, they're so going into music even, and they're going into sports. That's right. And for example, MBAs, you know, we need MBAs that are, they, they can handle business affairs. We need curators. We need people to understand how to do acquisitions, how to do story development. Like, for example, if you're an executive, you got to be able to know how to read, especially if you're on the develop, development side. Did you take, you know, those type of, of courses that allow you to, to filtrate and vet the material? Because that's what they're looking for. Every day, we have folks asking us, do you have folks out there that are ready to go for this position? So we really need to cultivate the next generation. So it really starts there. Um, and then obviously, once you get into where the studios are really, um, you have all this talent development and DHR side of things and the recruitment, the Indeed entertainment career side of the, the things, you know, LinkedIn, all of those are opportunities to meet the people that are going to be hiring you. And I think that's why it's important to have events where you get to network and, and really build a community where you're going to meet this folks. Sometimes I feel like, yes, it's great to network, but I feel like a lot of this stuff is being done almost like because there's some sort of contractual or quota thing that needs to be fulfilled, but they're really not interested in hiring Latinos. Because if not, Ben, let's be honest you'd be seeing Latinos everywhere in every branch of media, and we don't see that. So there's right. obviously some sort of bridge that's been broken that doesn't allow Hispanics to connect to that place. And I'm trying to figure out what it is. Is it racism? Is it prejudice? Is it that Caucasian executives feel that we're incompetent, that we, that our accents are too bothersome, that we don't have anything in common with them. And because it's a tribal thing with, uh, with, with, with executives, like you have to kind of be like me, then you're almost forcing a Hispanic to kind of be white almost to be able to fit in into groups. That way you can get promoted you can get hired. And what at the end of the day is it that detracts us it, it's From, a compound effect. It's definitely a combination of all the things. Uh, usually people hire 
folks that look like them. And it's, it's, it's definitely proven. You can, you've seen it in all the different studies, all these collusion things. They, there's a tendency to, when you're interviewing, and even when you look at a resume that has a, a last name with a, with a C at the end, there's already an assumption, an unconscious bias that really filters in. And so what happens, a lot of, even those, those folks who are hiring, they have a tendency to think, well, they might not be as qualified. They're, they already have that in their brain. So by the time they come in for that interview, there's that, that seeps in all the way through. And, and how do we overcome to, that, though? Well, that's that's one of the reasons why it's important to let the work speak for for itself. Uh -huh. I think that's what we, for example, found that go. works is like, look, making someone undeniable takes time. I, I, it might be maybe a little bit easier on the creative side, but how do you do it? Like, I'm a great executive in the making. Well, it really takes a family of folks. And by the way, there's a lot of incognito Latinos out there uh, in the in the studio system that they might not want to go out of their way in the beginning because they're like, I might be the only Latino in this department and I don't I don't want to really expose myself yet. But in other communities, you really see that more of that kind of coming together. And they're like, they're like, no, let's bring in as many of you know our people here. That's important. And they're not, it's not that they're not qualified. But we need to bring them in because we need this perspective. I think the one thing that might change things, um, I mean, right now you sit in the African-American communities, and I've seen that you covered it in, in some of the other podca podcasts, which is the, the the Black Panther effect and, and, and the Cocoa effect. You know, they see us as a plus factor now. And by, when, when I say them, you know, it, this is the ecosystem, you know. Um, when they become colorblind is really when they see the dollar, right? At right. the end of the day, it's green. And they see the potential for growth. One of the things where we might be missing in action is that they're focused so much on the global side of things, especially on the feature side. Look, mm. that they're looking to grow franchises, and that's where we might – we are at an advantage but also at a disadvantage because obviously we're looking at how do we satisfy the appetite of Asia and China. And so what happens, um, they realize like, wait a minute, Coco actually travels, family themes, uh, honoring the past, honoring your family. And they see, whoa, it opens up well in those markets. So we need to have more case studies. So that's on the creative side. On the executive side, I agree with you, Jack. It's really having to hire ourselves. We got to be able to be out there. But and the thing with us is that, as you know, we have to be 100 times better than anybody else on us <laughs> candidates, right? And well, so, same thing with you women. want to look yeah. brilliant. If I hire five of them and I bring them into my studio, right, or anything like that, right? They have to be super brilliant because I want to make sure that my boss knows that, hey, these people are ready to go. And um, and this also the other fear that sometimes there's the competition thing, right? Like, is this Latino going to take my job if I happen to be have the token Latino uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> job on that particular thing? And that usually happens when, especially the older mentality, you know, I would say that that's like mentality 2.0, you know, like the 2000s. I see more collaboration now. And I see more of that hunger to fill those positions. So it's systemic, right? Um, now, when we focus, for example, on Oscar So White, right? A lot of times we focus at the end of the spectrum. But as you know, we got to focus at the beginning. But we got to focus on all of them at the same time. That's why this work is so hard to do. I think it's important to really understand how this... By the way, the moment that you read a trade, mm -hmm. you know, like Biarity or Hollywood Reporter, and you think you understand where things are going, especially on buyers and sellers... The moment that the next day that that same uh, idiom it just gets disrupted the next day, like automatically. The next minute. Everybody was so hot <laughs> on Snapchat, for example. I, five years ago, no, two years ago, I was encouraging people, you know what? You might want to look at the Snapchat thing. It's really important. Like definitely get into the tech side and not necessarily Snapchat by itself, but I told them, look, this entertainment, short form, all of that. But then as you see even that platform struggling, then it makes uh, some of our folks a little nervous whether they should invest their entire career on that side. I still encourage people to understand the tech side of things because I want to grow the generation that will not just add to like the Netflixes of the world, but what happens to those folks that will disrupt those forces. You right, know, what's right. going to happen when you have someone who really understands entertainment, media and tech, that convergence to be honest, I think that's the key to the future because that, that they'll is. be way ahead of everybody. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, you had mentioned the African-American community and I wanted to talk about that with you for a second. What is it that the African-American community is doing differently than la the Latino community? I, I think there's also a combination of things. They they really rally together. Um, and it didn't happen before. I've, I've been having a lot of conversations with different folks in, in that particular community, really allies. That's another thing that it's really important for Latinos to also grow that bridge with other communities of color, uh, with African-Americans, with Native Americans and Asians, because... All of us can share strategies. And uh, one example is African-American Film Critics Association. They went from an, an association that started um, hosting their awards at, I think, at a, 
at a restaurant in New Orleans or something like that in Atlanta or and and now they've grown into a powerhouse and they rally each other and they invited me to their their award show right and I was I saw Eva DuVernay Jordan Peele all these folks supporting one another and one of the key things that Eva DuVernay which is incredible a powerhouse every time she speaks and and all the work by the way she's hiring a lot of Latinas on on Queen Sugar her show and we'll we'll, we'll go into that in a, in a awesome bit. good to hear um, that. But Eva DuVernay spoke um, about how she helped that organization grow. And she used to be on the publicity marketing side of things before she pursued her own directing career. And she used to be getting down on her knees, like, like, like putting down the red carpet and calling all the journalists and all those people doing the hard, the hard work. She helped to grow that network organically, call by call, ally by ally. And now you see her, you know, like less than seven years later, she's now taking, you know, accepting an award from the same organization that she, she helped to grow. So cool. So that is spirit of helping each other out is really, really important. We do really we haven't not have that, that much. We do have that. Unfortunately, there's not enough of us in those positions of power. For example, on the publicity side, we're growing those ranks, but um, um, we need to really like solidify that. Also, there's another issue that I'm sure you covered on your show before, which is the intersections, right? We're not a monolith. So, for example, I see for uh, uh, sometimes, you know, the Mexican-American community, for example, not, you know, sometimes, you know, going to 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 like Twitter battles with like the Central American community. Sometimes you have uh, LGBTQ Latinos and Afro Latinos not being represented. Um, Latinas missing out of the conversation where we're discussing issues that are advancing the entire group of people. And so I think it's it's very important to really have conversations and dialogue that that move us. Um, as a block, right? But unfortunately, we have a tendency to also um, have different subgroups, and and sometimes, well, we become a little bit divisive. And I'm not, I'm not. It's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing and a curse. One example: one one year we decided, hey, you know, why don't we create a showcase for, um, you know, for Latinos here in Los Angeles? We now grew it to the Latino Media Fest, and the first year we decided to. Why don't we program a lot of Puerto Ricans, a lot of like, like, did, like let's make it a Puerto Rican you know, theme. I think it's very important. There was so much hunger for that group, especially now, a lot of the ones that are moving from New York, New York Ricans, moving to Los Angeles. And a lot of those folks that had, you know, TV shows and films. And we decided to promote them and, and, and especially from the island, too. And Angel Manuel Soto uh, with his film. Um, he premiered it there with us, and it was it was fantastic to have that film and the Puerto Rican community coming out. But guess what? Do do will they come out to support, let's say, Chilean Americans or Argentine Americans? It's really hard. Sometimes it becomes a little polarized. And what we decided to do, specifically at Nalip, is like, why don't we create a bigger tent where we really start having these dialogues and conversations where we come together as a, as a group? We're stronger together. That's really the type of things that's good. So we do have it, but we really need to grow it even more. Right. Um, and so it takes a village. Like I said, it's really yeah. it's really going out there. It's really multiplying the the, the, the folks who are cross pollinators and the people that really come, you know, like to bring in communities together like you. Um, the conversations that you're having on, on this podcast are so important. And who's out there really discussing them? You see them on panels here and there. But I think I would love to make, you know, to see more folks really add into the conversation and really. Let's walk the walk. I think it's time to really walk the walk and start opening up more positions um, that allow our people to come together and really succeed in every segue of entertainment. Yeah, listen, um, I, I think what you're saying is is inspiring, you know, um, and it's, it's one of those things that that kind of leads me to the next question, which is about language. You know, we want our stories to be told, but there's two languages in which we can choose to tell those stories. Yes. Spanish language and English. And I understand that Latinos from Latin America want to come to the United States and they're the ones that are complaining, hey, we want our stories to be told. But, you know, not for nothing, you have a whole like half a continent all the way from Mexico to Argentina to be able to tell those stories. But they want to be able to tell them here in the United States because that is where the the heart of it all is, right? The heart of entertainment of the world really comes out of Hollywood. So what do you think is the the future of, of language? Is Spanish language stories in the United States the way to grow in the future or are we looking at its slow demise compared to English language stories for Latinos? I, I, I think for us, for example, uh, when, when people ask me, so uh, who can become a member of Nalip? I always ask them one, um, are you Latino friendly? And uh, if that's a yes, that's check, right? Listen, awesome. Two, do you believe in Latinos uh, being in positions of power above and below the line? 
uh, in entertainment and media. And if they say yes, I'm like, well, welcome to Nalip. That's we want you as a member because you believe in these two things. Uh, those are the very important points. And so when it comes to looking at the demographic that we're representing right now, it just so happens that the majority of our members happen to they're bilingual, they're bicultural, but they operate a lot in English and a lot of their work happens to be general market. I spend so much time just when I, let's say, no, like, like I go to a network or a studio and maybe those executives do not know about Nalip. The first thing they ask me is like, how many, so this is Spanish language, right? This is Univision Telemundo territory. And I'm like, actually, the majority of our members <laughs> happen to be creating general market Look at um, that. Uh, type of materials. And we consume general market. We, uh, we, we do. make Fast and Furious hit, you know, hits out, out of those shows. We consume horror more than anybody. We over-index in both the box office and, and the ratings on television. So we, we binge watch, you know, the shows on, on streaming. Um, we uh, consume platforms. more digital content than anybody exactly. else. Exactly. And so we're consuming a lot of English content. So we're also creating a lot of English content. And, and sometimes I do have a, a really good, uh, a passionate conversations with folks that are like, well, what about the, the, the film festivals that mostly promote Spanish language films? It's pretty easy to just program the best Latin, Latin American films. And what about the U.S. Latinos? And I always say, you know what? You're right. That's one of the reasons why it's really important, because a lot of those systems, ecosystems in those countries, the government and the, the, the ministries of culture and, and film, they spend money and the resources to send their filmmakers to these film festivals in Cannes, Berlin, Sundance, and you name it. Where is the subsidy here in the U.S. for right. Latino content creators? Let's Absolutely. look at that. Absolutely. Where is the artist development? So obviously there's NEA, NEA, there's Time Warner Foundation. There's a lot of different foundations different the, doing the work. You have some of the sisters organizations like Sun and Tribeca Film Independent. But as a block, where is the subsidy for the Latino content creator to go out there and pitch their films? At there's the challenge and there's the hole. And so, so that's I think, the other part. Yeah, I think that's why a lot of Latinos, at least here in New York and Miami and Los Angeles, they start heading down the road of 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 wanting to become a reggaeton star, a DJ, mm -hmm. a disc jockey, yep. you know, uh, or or even an athlete. Because, I mean, not for nothing, you just look at music, and it's like almost anybody can be a star in the music business if you're Latino. Sports, the same thing. But when you yes. start looking at directors and actors, you you start looking and going. But who of my friends have made it? It just becomes completely discouraging for you to go into that business because you're going to get hit and challenged from the moment you walk in. So yes. you were talking about Univision and Telemundo. How are you guys helping them with this new generation of Hispanics? Because they're obviously stuck in Spanish language and they're not really looking at the research. And if they are, like I feel Univision is probably the most progressive of the two media companies. They're trying to do something, but I don't know if it's necessarily working because I don't think they have the people in place to make that happen, to execute and create that vision and follow it through. So how is Nalip helping them out? Or are you guys at odds from philosophical differences? On the contrary, we, we see them as great allies. In fact, um, we launched an incubator that incorporate, incorporated, this is two years, three years ago, uh, where we incorporated both the uh, the Univision and Televisa side of things, where a lot of that content that gets, you know, it's created by Televisa ends up being um, broadcast on the Univision network on the U.S. side. They've, they've gone through a tremendous transformation. They, they definitely, both networks have been hit by the reality of changing audiences, changing habits. Um, and so they, obviously, each of them had their own business agenda, how to, how to go about to, to essentially... Uh, you know, transform their their programming and their development process. So we like we really enjoy the you know the, uh, uh, partnering up with them and helping them figure it out and also listen to them and also for us to you know present what we see as content creators. Like we would love to have opportunities for like let's say the new generation telenovela. If that is a thing, what would that look like if we incubated right. that? And we help to work together so that way by the time it comes out on the U.S. side of things, on the consumption side of things, it's something much more organic where U.S. Latinx audiences can consume as opposed to just the abuelita. Because they're, you know, that, that, that population that's watching the content was aging a, a little bit. So I think it's important. And by the way, all of them are pivoting right now. They see it and they're investing. And I can see everything from like the entire Univision family, the Fusion Group, the El Rey Network. 
um, uh, you name it. They're, they're right now revamping everything. On the Televisa side, even themselves, they have to adjust now because they have Netflix competing in the backyard. So they started creating a new platform. For example, they invested in Blend. They're trying to invest in different things. They're definitely trying. And I think it's important for us to to really engage them at this process um, to 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 strengthen that. Uh, we you, cannot ignore this 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 sleeping giant because at the end of the day, that's where the majority of our folks came from, you know. And and the, the important part is that that's a lot of the, the that population is still watching Spanish language television. But to transform a network and a studio and, and an entire ecosystem might be. It might take time. It, it might, might take, take time. time. Maybe so a, maybe a generation or two. We can't let them fail either. That's important because what happens if, think about it, like what happens if they go way of the dodo? What happens if they, if they, if they do not survive? Then where's our voice? Think about it. It's already limited. How many studios or networks do you see out there that really engage our audience? And then we lose um, a major important ally in that ecosystem, you know, a platform where people can create for. So I think it's important to keep it help mm-hmm. transform it, and then go, go on to the next level. But is Spanish um, the way? Or do you think that Univision and Telemundo should transform and become an English language network for Latinos? Well, they're actually making headway into English language uh, efforts. So they do have other, like each of them have their own like different, um, 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 you know, they're, they're, they're actually looking into engaging that as well. You can see it on the Universal side of things, on the on the. Uh, Comcast, NBC, Universe uh, side of things, and also the um, uh, for Univision, they're also looking at. They invested a lot of different properties that will allow them to create content in English. So they're definitely looking into how do they transform and how do they pivot. So, but I think it's important for us to be there. Hold. It's also important to hold their feet to the fire. In your in your case, I think you're bringing up important points that, believe me, they're considering it. And there's also, you know, a lot of folks have have uh, have cycled out of the company. And new new blood is coming in as well, which I think is really important to engage them. Speaking and, of new blood, com- speaking yeah. of new blood, you know, uh, Randy Falco is leaving, as you know, the CEO of Univision, and mm-hmm. he mostly has a senior management of Caucasian executives, which I am fully against. Um, for obvious reasons, the new CEO, who do you think it should be? What kind of person you think should be leading the next Univision into the future? Always my, my, I think it's always a visionary who is the, 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 the proper executive that has the vision to take the organization, to take that, that entire company into, into the 21st century. I think it's important for them to really invest in what they're already doing, but really doubling down and exactly addressing some of the issues that you're bringing up. Are we uh, becoming a powerhouse or are we somehow decreasing our presence? What is the impact of, of our folks overall when our, we walk, right? We boat with our eyes, right? Mm-hmm. And the moment that, that, that the ratings start going down, obviously any leader has to be able to respond but being able to put together a 10, 10 year vision type of plan that will allow the, the, the entire uh, organization and, and company to really adopt to that, but also see the trends. I think it's looking at the C generation. A lot of folks were focusing just on the millennial side, mm-hmm. but now if they focus on the C generation, I think that's, that's really an important part. As far as executives, I think it's always important to look at um, um, how are they, you know, I mean, for me, uh, I am not as, uh, for example, I'm not as privy into the plan that they have, especially with those new executives. I think for us is looking at the overall goal and how they engage the community. And our area, which is on, on the organizational side, is like, how do we find opportunities within that ecosystem for our content creators? And some of them might be Spanish language and some of them might be English language folks. So how do we get that going? And I think if we have those executives that are friendly and receptive, to our to our content creators, I think we got something really really great going there. Now, if it's if it's a situation where they might not be as receptive, or maybe they're not really seeing those trends, I think that's where I, I Jack, I think you got a point. You know, are they understanding what's happening? And and it's it's and, and it's not just that those networks, by the way, everybody. Like, look at even on the streaming side, are they as responsive to the needs of our of our community? Well, that's I'll give you an example. They're greenlining a lot of Spanish language shows, which is great. But where are the shows that are in English that are going to help grow? And there seems to be some changes there. But 
are we holding, uh, uh, for example, Amazon and Netflix, uh, you know, their feet to the fire as well, you know, and are we encouraging them? Are we growing right. the pipeline together? You know, the, the, the I reason think that's the, important. The reason I bring that up is because, you know, I was talking to uh, Felix Gutierrez. You might know him. He's the professor emeritus uh, at the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. And I had a conversation with him and and because I asked him the same question. Do you think do you support the idea of having another Caucasian person as the CEO of Univision? And he says, look, here's the problem about having a Caucasian in that position. First of all, it removes the opportunity for a Hispanic to be running his own cultural media company, right? Uh, number two, the problem with Caucasians running Spanish language media or any other foreign language, uh, foreign cultural uh, media company within the United States is that they have no intuition of, of, of what the audience and the consumer wants. They're basing every decision based on mathematics, stats, crunch numbers. Right. Right? Analytics, yep. Analytics. And we all know that stats can only give you so much. At the end of the day, you have to have an understanding of the culture. He said, quote, you have to live it to be able to understand it. The kind of person who should be running that, in my opinion, someone who grew up in a family where the parents or grandparents were immigrants. Because that's a big chunk of the audience. People are looking for a connection to where they came from and who have children who know both languages or use both languages. They may be more familiar with one than another. And then the next generation after them, their you know, grandchildren or whatever, are probably more English comfortable than Spanish comfortable. Um, and if you don't have that family, that take-home experience, it's going to make it difficult for you to understand the complexities of the audience because you're relying on number crunchers and uh, you know audience right. surveys and those types. The people, the data people, are telling you what your audience is. You should know what your audience is by living with that audience and in this generation. Uh, I also think that there's a problem with uh, it being so male dominated. Yeah, and that may be a bigger issue. I mean, you look at where their audience figures are, and you know they have a heavy female viewership and certainly their ads are geared you know, largely in that direction why not have a woman so i ask you again do you feel do you support a caucasian person being the next ceo whether it's a female or a male of univision or a spanish language media company i support a ceo that will support our community so my, i i even if they're white. I, well, here's the thing, though. I do not know specifically that person that's coming in. So I think it's important to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. But yes, I do agree on, on the fact that living it is very important to understand this community. It's very, very important. And so, but but at the same time, they are bound by a lot of the, the shareholders. And, and you can go into that as well. Like how many of those shareholders happen to be from the Latino community? Right. So they're looking at the bottom line. They're looking at are these people going to write in the ship? So the question is, like, how deep is that executive talent pool that can take those networks into the next into the next level? So I think it's important to have a Latino there. I completely agree with that. But also it's important to make sure that even if you have a Latino there, what about that? What is that's the other side of the coin? Right. What if you have a Latino there, but yet they go completely against everything that's meant to advance Latinos in media. Because I've seen that a lot too. Oh, well, what yeah, there? there, there's, there's an example. <laughs> uh, somebody that might not necessarily support U.S. Hispanics uh, in this country, exactly. and they support and only exclusively Latin Americans, right. which is like a whole issue. Kid. It's like, listen, exactly. we're in the United States. Both of I you agree. media companies need to understand you're the basis, the, the, the ground, the foundation of your company that is not anywhere south of the border it's here in the united states either la or miami focus on the u.s hispanic what are you doing for them they're the ones that are outpacing immigrants more than exactly. ever in the last 10 years that's who we're listening to we're listening to for example the the content creators if they see that there's some sort of imp imp impenetrable fortress and they're not getting access to those specific networks we're listening to our membership those are the ones that are keeping us super honest because we might be pursuing a particular strategy and our members are saying, you know what, we're not getting anywhere with this particular, they're not buying our content, they're not really being responsive to things. Same thing for executives that are like, look, look, we're not really moving forward, we're not get really getting promoted. That's when it's important for us as an organization to engage. But for me, always is looking, okay, what about the talent pipeline? 
do we ha- are they investing in that? Are they investing in something that's going to benefit them long term as well? And so that's where Nalip is really that's where our core strengths are, making sure that we have a relationship, help them build a pipeline and making sure that they are also responsive to the need for this content that's very responsive to the needs of our community especially U.S. Latinos, especially the largest population. Here, for example, in California, there's no excuse in New York because we are probably, you know, I think by 2050, right? We know the numbers, where it's going. So I do appreciate that, that there's efforts being done, but they're going to be running out of time because you're right. What is the, uh, the, the effect of them not responding? They're going to go bankrupt. And they're, they're going, going to implode. To they're merged. going to implode something that needs to they're be preserved. Implode. Benjamin Lopez, Executive Director of Nalip, thank you so much for being on the Highly Relevant Podcast. It's such a pleasure. Thank you for having us. That's it for me. I'd like to thank Ben Lopez, Executive Director of Nalip, for being on the show. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and leave a review on our iTunes page. I'm Jack Rico. See you next week on another episode of Highly Relevant.